Hi, I'm Crystal Jay. I'm from the Department of General Practice at the University of Otago in New Zealand. During the mid-1980s, workers in industrialised nations began complaining of debilitating symptoms attributed to tasks performed in the workplace. In Australia, these workplace disorders became known as repetitive strain injury, or RSI, and later occupational overuse syndrome, or OOS, in New Zealand. Increasing rates of RSI, or OOS, were linked to changes during the late 20th century in work patterns in developed and developing nations. These resulted in decreased job security for workers, lower wages, higher unemployment rates and increasing pressure on workers through new management strategies, intensified labour and demands for increased productivity. In New Zealand the term OOS is commonly used as an umbrella term for a number of work-related musculoskeletal disorders. Although the prevalence of OOS is considered to have decreased as a result of improved health and safety monitoring in the workplace, OOS injuries currently comprise at least 6.5% of all workplace injuries in New Zealand. In recent years, improved workplace ergonomics and clinical management of people who develop OOS has resulted in fewer sufferers deteriorating to debilitating chronic conditions. However, OOS still carries significant implications for workers, with options of physical rehabilitation, reduced hours, light duties within the workplace, or in serious cases, being put off work or resignation. The personal experiences and perspectives of workers who suffer from OOS injuries have not been well documented. Previous research in the UK and Australia has described OOS as a pilgrimage of pain with repeated assaults to sufferers' integrity and their sense of self as sufferers attempt to gain medical legitimacy in the form of a diagnosis that acknowledges work-related etiologies and to secure effective treatment and management. Illness and chronic pain often have profound effects on the relationship that sufferers have with their own bodies. Problematics in experiential embodiment or embodiedness in the form of objectification, bodily strangeness and alienation have been previously described across a range of illness experiences such as chronic pain, chronic obesity, organ transplantation and stroke. In this paper, we discuss issues of embodiment and liminality associated with OOS based upon our analysis of the narratives of workers who have suffered ongoing sequelae from OOS injuries for between 2 and 20 years. Specifically, we explore the ways in which embodiedness becomes problematic for OOS sufferers in the face of the functional impairment and increased bodily surveillance and discipline that OOS precipitates. We suggest that this problematic extends beyond biographical disruption to concepts of injury to a sense of embodied integrity and a liminality characterised by perduring fragility. In the first instance, res uh, respondents positioned themselves as good workers, as hard workers. They were acutely aware that they literally embody the ideologies and practices of the capitalist workplace, the disciplining techniques of supervisors and employers, and workplace culture and praxis. This was often woven into explanations of why they were susceptible or predisposed to developing OOS injuries. I quote, I'm the kind of person that goes in and I work hard, and at that point I was basically in charge of that branch, so I was picking up everybody else's workload. When things were getting behind or something, I was probably pushing myself harder than I should, unquote. As workers broke down physically and their ability to perform work tasks became impaired, this identity as a good or a hard worker became more difficult to maintain. Respondents described struggling to resist labels such as malingerer, shirker, liar, unreliable, that epitomised the antithesis of a good worker. The respondent quoted above continued, I quote, but the pain quite often interfered with my sleep. I felt bad at work because I was not able to basically pull my weight the whole time. Your workmates start resenting it after a while. I mean, some of the times that I was put on part-time work, I'd go home early. And the comments that I got from other staff was, oh, well, you've got a great job, haven't you? Well, I found that really hard to deal with, seeing your fellow workmates doubting what you're saying, unquote. The biographical disruptions precipitated by illness and the biographical work that continues in the face of illness have been well documented. Biographies and autobiographies are not fixed or static texts, rather they are subject to reworking through narrative strategies. This reworking has been previously described as an attempt to locate and or create plausible meaning, coherence and significance. Similarly, our respondents often reinterpreted previous events in light of subsequent injuries. One woman talked about how her oos symptoms did not arise in her arms but went all over her and remained 
all over her and seemed to encompass all sorts of previous health and physical problems, including a horrific vehicle accident. This attempt to reconcile pre-illness and illness periods is a feature of illness narratives. Our respondents situated themselves as injured workers with chronic and debilitating conditions against a biographical context where they worked hard, they were physically and socially active, and they provided and cared for their families. Their chronic ooze conditions had affected every aspect of their lives, heralding radical changes in employment status and work capacity within family and social relationships, particularly with gendered role expectations within the domestic sphere and leisure and sports activities. This appeared particularly problematic for the few male respondents for whom physical prowess and staunch work ethic was a key characteristic of their pre oos masculinities. For example, one respondent, a male respondent previously a butcher told us and I quote, I was very good at boning, exceptionally good if I had to say so myself. And I ran my own boning room for 20 years between freezing works and running my own business. And I'm talking about boning anything up to 80 sheep a day. I broke the 118 at one stage, one day. The best I ever did was 24 in one hour. Beef, I've done 13 bodies in one day. That was my best. And I must add that 20 years boning is quite the exception. Most boners don't last 10 years, and he continues after a little while. And now you feel pathetic, you feel useless. You know, the place is going to rack and ruin, the wife's on, you need to do this, you need to do that, unquote. Arthur Frank wrote that self-recognition alters in the face of chronic illness so that people no longer recognise themselves. Respondents in the present study talked poignantly of this process as they struggled to cope with their chronic loose injuries. Underlying their accounts is a sense of, great, sense of great ambivalence. Is it possible to recover the person they once were? Who are they now? Who will they become? One respondent talked of losing her athletic self, but discovering as she coped with chronic oose that she was an enduring, resourceful and creative self. Another talked of how she had become a crippled, withdrawn and fragile self. Accommodating a disabled body within oneself was problematic for many respondents. They pondered whether their injuries were to parts of themselves, to their bodies or to their whole person. One male respondent repeatedly said, and I quote, it hurts me, unquote, in reference to his symptoms, his relationship with his workplace and his life post-injury. Respondents frequently alternated between talking about my arms and the arms during their interviews. Another respondent argued that she herself was fine, it was just her arm that was sore. In another example, one woman talked about how she came to perceive her injured neck as somehow distinct and separate from herself, and I quote, and I still talk about my neck as if it's this whole separate identity like my neck, you know what I mean? It's taken on a whole persona of its own, my neck, me, and my neck. So it's become this whole separate thing that I have to think about, and it's got a whole life of its own, unquote. 